Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. We're really excited to have you here. Right. So I'm just uh, admitting a, a couple of people I see that are popping up on the screen that want to join us. All right, so I'm gonna get started and as I see them up here, I will admit them. So if you see me look away, that's what I'm doing. Uh, my name is Katie Rothley. I'm a librarian who does adult services, marketing and outreach here at the Lyon Township Public Library. And I wanna say on behalf of my library and my colleagues that make up the Neighborhood Library Association at Salem South Lyon District Library, Commerce Township, Community Library, Wald Lake City Library, Novi Public Library, Wixom Public Library, and Northfield District Library that we're very excited to host story productions tonight for this fascinating interactive historical presentation on Joe and Rose Kennedy. But before I introduce our guests, I wanna go over a few housekeeping details so you're gonna hear me talk for a little bit. <laughs> we are recording this Zoom event. The recording will be available through each Neighborhood Library Association library. So check with your particular home library to locate where they keep it. Uh, Lyon Township Public Library will be sharing it on our YouTube channel and Facebook page, and it may be similar for the other libraries as well. Um, also, I will be monitoring, monitoring the chat. Uh, our presenters will not be taking any questions, but uh, we will be having a question and answer session at the end with questions that we gathered uh, ahead of time from the libraries. And I will be asking our guests these questions. Um, the chat will mostly just be available for me. So if you have questions, uh, any logistics problems with Zoom, just let me know. Um, any comments? We hope that you will be fully engaged in the content the actors will be sharing and enjoy the Q&A session I'll be asking our guests at the end again. If, however, there is anything disruptive during the Zoom meeting, whether through sound or video, it may result in your dismissal from the Zoom meeting. We want to make sure everyone can enjoy the shared event in a comfortable and safe online environment. So next, we want to share that many of our libraries are wrapping up our annual summer reading challenges, if we haven't already, and that depends on your home library. We want to sincerely thank you for your participation, ongoing support, and hope that you thoroughly enjoyed all that our summer reading programs had to offer. And on that note, we do have another NLA sponsored event coming up on Monday, August 31st at 7 p.m. So we hope that you will join us. You just need to register like you did for this one on LTPL's event calendar, and that's at ltpl.org. Um, that way you will receive the email that contains the Zoom link and passcode to join us. We're pleased that we can offer another historical presentation, this time with actor Kevin Wood, who will be portraying Abraham Lincoln. We also have other online events or programs, as we call them, happening on a regular basis. So please check your home library and any of our neighboring libraries for what's coming up. You can find all of our programs on each library's website and Facebook page, but I highly recommend visiting websites first, just in case something didn't make it onto Facebook. Lastly, we will have a survey uh, for feedback that will be sent out in an email, and I think it will be tomorrow. So if you don't mind filling that out for us, we really appreciate your input. Now, without further ado, let's go back in time to 1961. So gas was 31 cents, bread was 22 cents, and movies were about 69 cents. January 10th, President Kennedy was sworn in as the 35th, uh, 35th president January uh, 7th was the first NFL playoff bowl, runner-up bowl. Detroit beats Cleveland 17 to 16. January 15th, Barry Gordy signs the Supremes with Motown Records. And January 31st, Ham the Chimp, a 37 pound male is rocketed into space aboard Mercury Redstone 2 in a test of the Project Mercury capsule designed to carry uh, astronauts into space. So. I'm pleased 
that we have distinguished guests Joe and Rose Kennedy with us. We're thrilled that you're here um, at this event in 1961. Our guests, Joseph P. Kennedy, former ambassador to England, and his wife Rose, um, of course, are the parents of our current president, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And now, let me introduce Mr. Joseph P. Kennedy. Thank you, Katie. It's, uh, it's a pleasure for Rose and I to be here with you tonight on this uh, wonderful evening in uh, 1961. I, I hope you weren't expecting our son, Jack. Uh, he's pretty busy running the country as president now, as you know. Well, we don't have any speeches for you, but rather we understand you have some questions and uh, we'd like to be orderly. So we've asked that you uh, collect your questions and number them and we'll take them in order. So uh, let's get started. Uh, uh, what is the first question and who is it for? Uh, so the first question is for Mrs. Kennedy. How did you two meet? Oh, how did we meet? Well, for one thing, our family would vacation each summer at Old Orchard Beach in Maine, as did other Irish um, Boston um, Catholic Boston uh, people, and that included uh, Kennedy. Uh, we met um, often, but I don't remember the first time we met, but I'm told we were quite young. But I do remember becoming increasingly attracted to Joe when I was 16. Well, I fell in love with his 100-watt smile, and I was thrilled when he finally invited me to a dance at his prep school, Boston Latin. But father said no. My father, John Fitzgerald, was the mayor of Boston at the time, called Honey Fitz for his sweet Irish voice. Well, anyway, I think that father said no to Joe because he did not care for Joe's father, P.J. Kennedy, uh, because he supported father's political opponent. Oh, but I was flattered that Joe was interested in dating me and having father refuse. Why, that made it more exciting and romantic. Well, we did manage to see each other in secret. Well, secret from father anyway. We would meet at friends' homes, and I invited him to my high school dances. Now, in those days, we had dance cards. And Joe would fill out my card with all these fake names, think, making father think I danced all night with different <laughs> boys. But in fact, I danced all night with Joe. Oh, quite fun. Well, Joe finally proposed to me, and I don't remember his exact proposal. But I do remember the two-carat diamond uh, engagement ring, and I said yes right away. We were married October 7th, 1914. It was a small, modest wedding with a uh, family and a few close friends. And the honeymoon, oh, why, that was wonderful, carefree, and very romantic. So that, uh, I hope, answers your question. And who has the next question and who is it for? All right. So the next question is for Mr. Kennedy. When did you start a family? Well, Katie, as I remember, it was uh, nine months and two weeks after the wedding. Uh, that was 1915. And that was our son, uh, first son, Joe Jr. was born. Uh, two years later, in 1917, our second son, John Fitzgerald, whom we called Jack, was born. That was a month after we had gotten into World War I. So I got a position in management with a company building warships. Uh, during that time, our first daughter, uh, Rosemary, was born. And uh, then the war was over in 1918, and I couldn't see much future, Katie, in a company that built warships. So I went to work for a, a brokerage firm and did some real estate. So Katie, that's how we got our family started. Uh, who was the next question for? Uh, the next question is for Mrs. Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy told us about your first three children. When were the rest of them born? 
Oh, you want to know when the other children were born? How sweet of you. Well, in 1920, our second daughter, Kathleen, was born. Now, Joe and the children called her Kick. In 1921, our daughter Eunice was born. And yes, if you're counting, that is five children in six years. 1924, our daughter Patricia was born and Robert in 1925. Three years later, daughter Jean was born, and four years after that, our last child, son Edward, was born. Well, we call him Teddy. Well, when Teddy was born, um, Joe was in Palm uh, Beach. Well, I guess he felt sorry for me because he arranged to have meals prepared at the Ritz Hotel and delivered to the hospital to me by way of taxi cab. Oh, wasn't that nice of him? Well, let's see. I do think we've covered all nine children. I hope I haven't forgotten anyone. Well, when they were growing up, the children were growing up, I kept index cards on each one of those with their medical history, oh, such as illnesses, shots, doctor's appointments, etc. That way I was always up to date with their health issues. It's very important to be organized when you have nine children. Well, most of them were fairly healthy physically, except for Jack. Oh, he seemed to be coming down with something all the time. I think he had nearly every childhood illness there was. I never thought he would have enough energy for any career, much less a career as president of the United States. So, Katie, that is the rest of our family, and I hope that answers your question. Who has the next one, or who's it for? Uh, the next one is for Mr. Kennedy. I heard that you were in the movie Business. Is that true? Yes, Katie. Uh, that's true. I was in the movie Business. Oh, I guess you'd like a little more detail. <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, we Kennedys have a sense of humor. And sometimes it uh, gets us into trouble, too. <laughs> well, I wanted to invest in an emerging industry, and I heard about this new moving picture industry. So I invested in it. And I set up a, a company to distribute films up and down the East Coast. Uh, I also bought a small theater. Well, then I found out that the small theaters like mine uh, could not afford many of the black blockbuster films produced in Hollywood. They were too expensive. So I set up a production company, FBO, to produce less expensive films like Westerns and action films that smaller theaters like mine could afford. Then I went out to Hollywood to make some contacts and uh, they said uh, I was very welcome there with my warm handshake and big smile. And unlike many of the cold fish movie producers they were used to uh, dealing with. Well, I was uh, so welcomed, I got involved in a total of three moving picture companies out there. And then a fellow named David Sarnoff came along. He put together a big company called RKO Pictures. He bought all the companies that I was involved in. Uh, so I did quite well, uh, Katie. I came back from Hollywood with a profit of $2 million. So that's my movie uh, business career. Uh, who was the next question for? Uh, the next question is for Mrs. Kennedy. What about your husband's friendship with the movie Hello. star Gloria Swanson? What was that all about? Ah, so you want to know about Joe and the relationship he had with Gloria Swanson. Well, for one thing, uh, Joe and his business associates helped straighten out her finances. Joe wanted to produce a film with her in it. Now, <clears throat> I have heard the rumors about uh, she and Joe being more than just business partners, but I believe that they were only rumors, well, I'm sure of it. So I decided I would just ignore those ugly gossip. Well, Joe did um, help uh, produce a film uh, called Queen Kelly with her star in it, and it was a disaster. Oh, it was poorly directed and never completed. Why, 
he lost nearly one million dollars on that project. It was the most uh, discouraging failure of his career. Uh, later, he did help produce her first talking film in 1929 called The Trespasser. Oh, and that was very successful. Big box office hit and very profitable. It made him feel better about the movie industry, but he decided that uh, he should quit while he was ahead. Now, as for Gloria Swanson, she had her own issues. And do you know that she eventually went through six husbands? Well, I do appreciate that question so I could clarify the relationship, but I do hope that's the last of those types of questions. So let's get on to the next question, uh, please. Katie? All right, so Mr. Kennedy, how did the stock market crash of 1929 affect you? Well, Katie, actually, uh, I did pretty well during the stock market crash. You see, I felt that the market was overheated in the late 1920s. And so I sold most of my stocks and kept my money in cash. Well, when the market started to rebound, uh, I started buying bargains. And I was, I was pretty good, Katie, at deciding which ones would uh, become profitable. For instance, in 1932, when the market was still a down, lost 20%, I doubled my money that year. But Katie, I wasn't so concerned about my finances at that time. Rather, I was more concerned about uh, my children, particularly Jack. Uh, it was becoming evident that Jack was very irresponsible. He was irresponsible about many things, money, his grades, his health, and Katie, even his clothes. Well, I visited him at Choate Prep School one time, and I said, Jack, if you would hang your clothes up after you wear them instead of throwing them on the chair or the sofa, just think of all the pressing charges you would save at the tailor shop. Now, money was never an issue for our children, but Rose and I did try to teach them to be frugal. We, we just didn't believe in them learning to waste money. So that's my stock market experience. Uh, who is the uh, next question for? Uh, the next question is for Mrs. Kennedy. Can you tell us about your children's education? Uh, yes, uh, let me begin with Joe Jr. Um, let's see, he enrolled uh, for a year in the London School of Economics. During the uh, summer, he traveled and visited uh, Russia and Germany and returned home with a rather rosy view of communism. Oh, he tried to enlighten his father on his view of communism until one day, uh, Joe just was so angry, he exploded. He said, when you sell your car and you sell your boat and you sell your horse, then I will let you talk about communism. But until that time, I don't want to hear another word about it in this house. And that did in those types of discussions. Oh, and then there was Jack. Now, when he was still in elementary school, he once remarked, if you study too hard, you're likely to go crazy. And as Joe said, he still was not applying himself at Choke Prep School. Apparently, the school's headmaster would refer to boys who did not quite live up to the school's standard of behavior, called them muckers. So Jack and his best friend Lynn decided to form a muckers club and they invited all of their classmates to join. Well, you can imagine the school was very upset when they learned about it. Oh, and Joe had to go to school to try to smooth out things. Well, uh, Joe did um, worry about Jack not living up to his potential, uh, not going as far up the ladder as he should. Uh, but the headmaster felt that Jack had a very clever an individualistic mind, and we should not have to worry about him. I guess he was right, wasn't he? How many of you have worried about a child only to find that they discovered success in their own way? So, um, Katie, that's just a couple of our children's education. I can't 
possibly go through all nine. So let's go on to the next question, please. Well, thank you, Rose. Uh, so, Mr. Kennedy, how did you become part of the Roosevelt administration? Well, Katie, in uh, 1934, uh, Franklin Roosevelt was concerned about the, uh, some of the uh, corruption and bad practices in the stock market. And so he set up the FEC, the, uh, secure, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which he asked me to head up because of my background in securities and banking. Well, I hired nothing but the best uh, young lawyers. You might have recognized a couple of these names, Abe Fortas and William O. Douglas. They later became justices of the Supreme Court. Well, we put together some programs to end uh, the corrupt practices. Then I made a radio broadcast in which I said that we would wage war unmercifully upon any brokers and uh, bankers who violated our rules, but we would in no way interfere with the respectable bankers and brokers who followed our rules. Well, the stock market had been not doing well at all since the crash. Uh, no one had any confidence in it, but after my radio speech, the market started to pick up. People began to invest in it, and the economy was on its way. There was a cover article in Time Magazine that featured me, and the statement was made that the uh, SEC was the best managed of all of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal activities. So I'm very proud of that, Katie. Uh, who's the next question for? Uh, the next question is for Mrs. Kennedy. Your sons, Joe Jr. and Jack, both enlisted in the service. Can you tell us about that? Yes, of course I will. Let's start with Jack. He enlisted in the Navy and was commissioned as officer in Naval Intelligence. But he wanted sea duty and volunteered and ended up on a PT boat. Now, as you probably know, his boat was rammed by a Jap destroyer and he almost died. He was awarded the Navy and Marine Corps medals for saving several of his crew members' lives. But he sustained rather serious back uh, problems and um, it ne uh, necessitated uh, in the future two uh, surgeries. And back, pa back pain plagues him to this day. But he has a good humor about it all. When once asked how he became a war hero, he said it was easy. They cut my PT boat in half. <laughs> <laughs> then there was um, Joe Jr. He enlisted in the Naval Air Corps and volunteered for a very dangerous and secret mission. He would pilot a, a B-24 Liberty bomber made right here in uh, Michigan in Will Run. Now the bomber was stripped down and filled with um, explosives. Uh, he would uh, pilot the plane over the English countryside and bail out after he turned over the controls remotely to the pilots flying in the two B-17s accompanied him. Then they, in turn, would fly and guide his plane by remote control across the English Channel and crash it into a predetermined target site. Well, after he uh, confirmed that his plane was flying remotely, but before he and his co-pilot could exit, it exploded. It was they were declared missing in action, but no bodies were ever found. It was devastating news for both of us, but especially for Joe. He had such high hopes for Joe Jr.'s future. My stronger religious faith helped me handle this tragedy better than Joe. So that tells you about uh, our boys' military uh, service and uh, let's go on to the next question, please. Uh, so, Mr. Kennedy, how was your experience serving as a U.S. ambassador to England? Well, Katie, I really enjoyed to be an ambassador to England. Uh, uh, being Irish, I really got along well with the British, 
Uh, and I love to play golf, and of course, golf was invented over there. Another advantage of that job was that it gave me a chance to uh, set up a wonderful education international relations for my, my two sons, Joe Jr. and Jack. I made appointments at uh, embassies throughout Europe, and they would visit the embassies and meet the ambassadors and meet world leaders. And uh, Jack's background in uh, international relations that he gathered during that time is hold him in good stead now as president. Well, that was the good part of the job. The bad part was, of course, this was prior to uh, the Second World War. Hitler was uh, making noises about invading different countries in Europe. Uh, my position was that if he ever invaded England, that uh, wouldn't take very long before he overtook England because the British or the Germans had the best air force in the world. So my position was make some compromises uh, with Hitler uh, on his ideas in, uh, of what he was going to do in, in uh, Poland and Czechoslovakia in return for a pledge not to attack England. Well, uh, Winston Churchill didn't agree with that. Uh, he felt that it uh, didn't matter what Hitler promised, he was eventually going to attack England anyway, might as well stop him now. Uh, turned out that Franklin Roosevelt agreed with Churchill, so here I was, I was kind of odd man out, Katie. In fact, the, I had heard from Washington, D.C. that there were rumors that uh, they wanted to bring me back from the post, have me resign. Uh, whenever I asked FDI, I said, how am I doing? He would say, you're doing fine, Joe. Well, I found out later that one of the reasons he kept me a little longer than he wanted to was that he was afraid if he brought me back, he might lose the Irish-American vote in the next election. But finally, I did resign. Uh, and it turned out that I was wrong about Hitler. You see, I thought he had the best interests of his country at heart. Like any good politician and businessman, he would negotiate and uh, keep his word. Well, turned out uh, it was not true. Hitler was crazy. He had this insane desire to rule Europe at all costs. And, uh, so I was wrong on that one. And my um, being wrong on that has plagued me really for the rest of my life. So uh, ambassador to England, a wonderful times, <laughs> very frustrating times, Katie. Uh, who is the next question for? So the next question is for, um, it's still for you. What did you do after resigning as ambassador to England? Well, Katie, I uh, went back into real estate. I started buying a lot of properties in New York, and I bought the Merchandise Mart in Chicago, which was the world's largest building at the time. Eunice's uh, husband, Sergeant Shriver, ran that for me. But uh, I really started getting more involved uh, with Jack. You see, he had graduated from Harvard. He worked as a journalist for a little while for the Hearst newspapers in California said to me one day, he said, Dad, you know, he said, I don't want to write about history. I'd rather help make history. So he decided to run for Congress in his grandfather, Honey Fitz's old district in Boston. And he did that. And then he later ran for the U.S. Senate, was elected to the Senate. Now, I uh, spent a lot of money in helping finance Jack's campaigns. Uh, he had a lot of criticism for that. But, you know, campaigns cost money. And I had the money. Uh, somebody has to finance it. Well, Jack was pretty good at handling these criticisms with humor. For instance, there was a dinner called the Gridiron Dinner held every year, and they, they kind of did a roast of Jack. They had a little skit about me financing his campaign. Well, uh, he got a chance for a rebuttal. And when he got up, he pulled out a piece of paper, supposedly a letter from me, that said, Dear Jack, don't spend a penny more than necessary to win. I refuse to pay for a landslide. So that's the way Jack handled criticism. So um, Rose was quite a campaigner, though, uh, in helping in both of Jack's campaigns. When she started out helping him become elected to the Congress, she had what she called coffee with the Kennedys. She would invite women in for coffee. I remember one of those coffee meetings had something like 2,000 people there. And she would introduce her war hero son, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Later, when he ran for the Senate, she got fancy and she sent out engraved invitations. 
to a reception with Mrs. Joseph P. Kennedy and her congressman's son, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Now, it turned out that there was evidence that the female vote was very important in all of Jack's elections, and Rose deserves a lot of the credit for that. However, I did observe that the ladies uh, were somehow attracted to Jack on his own. <laughs> anyway, who is the next question for? All right, so the next question is for Mrs. Kennedy. How did you like being the mother of a candidate when Jack was running for his first office as U.S. Congressman from Boston? Oh, at first, Katie, I was thrilled. But then one day I was uh, riding in a cab in Boston and I happened to ask the a cabbie, for whom would he, uh, does he think he might vote uh, for in this uh, upcoming election? And he said, oh, probably that uh, a young Kennedy kid from East Boston, because he had been in the Navy, and so had the cabbie. Well, I smiled and say, oh, that's good. And he said, why? Are you some relative or something? So I proudly said, yes, I am Rose Kennedy, his mother. Well, he slowed down the cab and said, my, am I ever glad to meet you. So I smiled and said, thank you. He said, Jack rode in my cab two days ago, and he still owes me $1.38. <laughs> so, of course, I paid um, uh, the cabbie for Jack, but I learned my lesson. Never again did I tell a cabbie who I was. So, okay, that's my experience, uh, my first time being a mother of a candidate. Uh, so, um, let's go on to the next question. Who is that for? The next question is for Mr. Kennedy. What was the toughest part of Jack's presidential campaign? Well, Katie, there were really three uh, major issues. One, of course, was religion. There had never been a Catholic elected president. Most people didn't think one ever could be elected president, including the leaders of the Catholic Church. They refused to openly support Jack. They were so convinced that he would lose, they didn't want to be tainted with the loss. You know, I've never quite forgiven the leaders of the Catholic Church for that. So religion was the one issue. The next was his health. Uh, Jack had had a lot of illnesses and injuries, as we've discussed, but his vigorous campaigning proved that he certainly was fit to serve as president. The third issue was his youth and his relative lack of experience, but his wonderful showing in the televised debates against his opponent, Vice President Richard Nixon, demonstrated that certainly his age and his experience were no liability. Now, in the campaign, there were some interesting things that happened. One time, uh, somebody actually questioned the number of people reported at one of his outdoor campaign rallies. Can you imagine that? People making an issue about how many people were at a campaign rally. <laughs> well, anyway, Jack, again, using his humor, deferred that. He said, you know, my press secretary, Pierre Salinger, he does the counting, and he tells me what he does as he counts the nuns and then multiplies by 100. So evidently, there were 350 nuns there that day. That's what he said. <laughs> well, anyway, Jack did win the election, as you know, very close on the popular vote, less than 1% uh, of the popular vote. Now, in the Electoral College, he did much better, some 300 to Mr. Nixon, some 200. Uh, but we were very proud of, of Jack, uh, youngest man ever elected to president at age 43, first Catholic ever elected as president. Uh, and again, uh, we're very proud of some of the things Jack did. Of course, his inaugural speech where he said, ask not what your country can do for you, but rather ask what you can do for your country has inspired people for years. Also, his pledge to put a man on the moon within 10 years, his founding of the Peace Corps, and him laying the groundwork for the Civil Rights Act were all things that we're very, very proud of. We're very proud of Bobby also. Bobby was his campaign manager, did a wonderful job. And of course, as you know, Jack appointed Bobby as his attorney general. Now, neither one of them wanted to do that. 
They said, everybody's going to talk about nepotism, which was true. But I said, Jack, with all that's going on in the country, you need a attorney general that you can trust completely, and that would be Bobby. Well, finally, they relented, uh, and so uh, they decided that he would appoint him. Well, one of Jack's friends, Jack had told him ahead of time that he was going to appoint him. This was before Jack was inaugurated, and the friend said, well, when are you going to announce to the public that you're appointing Bobby to the attorney general? He said, well, I'm going to step outside of our townhouse in Washington, D.C. one night about three o'clock in the morning. I'm going to look up and down the street, make sure nobody's there, and then I'm going to whisper, it's Bobby. So you can see how reluctant he was to do that. Uh, but it worked out fine. Uh, there was still some criticism after he appointed him. At one meeting, somebody said, uh, Mr. President, you know, your, your brother has a law degree, but has never practiced law. Uh, that doesn't seem quite enough for an attorney general. Jack said, well, you know, I think you're right. I think Bobby does need to practice law. And, you know, this attorney general job, that will give him a wonderful chance to get some experience before he practices law. You know, a man has to start somewhere. So that's the way that he would handle uh, things again with his wonderful sense of humor. Uh, now, after Jack serves his second term, which we're convinced will happen, uh, then, you know, Bobby may have a chance uh, at president too. We think he has a lot of ability. Uh, and then there's Teddy. Uh, Teddy is quite young. But he is showing some interest in politics. In fact, he may run for the Senate uh, next year. So Rose and I have always encouraged our children to get involved and do things for the public good. And they're certainly doing it big time. So who uh, is the next question for? The next question is for Mrs. Kennedy. Tell us about your reaction to being the mother of the President of the United States. Oh. Of course, I am so proud to be the mother of the President of the United States. Oh, it's just wonderful. You know that I campaigned for him in four of the seven primaries, and he won every one of those. And then after his nomination, I I gave 46 speeches in 14 states at the age of 70. Oh, people seem to really enjoy hearing my stories about the family. Uh, but I would like to add a little personal note. At the presidential inaugural ball, I wore the same dress that I wore in 1938 at my presentation uh, to the King and Queen of England in Buckingham Palace. That was when Joe was ambassador. Well, even the press noted that my figure had not shifted one inch in all those years. Oh, don't you think it's remarkable at my age and after nine children, I can still fit into a size eight. Well, um, I think that, um, oh, I have one more thing. My, uh, many people asked me about my um, pillbox hat, and, I'll, and they re it reminds them of Jackie. Uh, but, you know, uh, these pillbox hats were just the rave in Paris when I was visiting one summer, so I bought one for Jackie. And after she started wearing those, why, well, that started the trend in the U.S. So I had something to do with that as well. Uh, but I do think this is all the time that we have for questions. Uh, but before we close, Joe, would you like to add something? Yes. You want uh, to say anything, Joe? Yes, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting us here today to your library and to uh, hear about our family. We hope that you've enjoyed it and uh, learn a little something about it. Uh, and now uh, I'm going to step out of character uh, and do a little costume change here. Uh, <laughs> I'm not Joe Kennedy. You probably uh, know that, but I, I hope for a little while you did feel I was Joe Kennedy. Uh, Doré Productions, that's what we try to do, is to bring these historic characters to life for you so that you can experience a little bit uh, of their life. Uh, I'm really Russ Doré. I live in Northville. I've been involved in some historical productions for uh, over 20 years. Uh, and uh, at this time, I'd like to 
spend a little time uh, telling you about Joe's Kennedy's life after 1961. <clears throat> so Joseph Kennedy suffered a massive stroke in December of 1961 at age 73. Left him paralyzed on his left side and he suffered the loss of his speech ability. He was confined to a wheelchair. He lived to see his son, President John Fitzgerald Kennedy assassinated in 1963 and his son, Senator Robert Kennedy assassinated in 1968. Joseph Kennedy died in November of 1969 at age 81, outliving all of his sons except his son, Senator Ted Kennedy, who survived him by 40 years. Now, Joe Kennedy was a highly controversial individual. He spoke honestly to the point of bluntness. He was also known as a womanizer, a self-centered individual, and was anti-Semitic. Because of his appeasement position in Germany, during the war, he had to stay in the background during JFK's presidential campaign. But he was close to his nine children and inspired each to reach the highest level of contribution to society that each of them was capable of. So just think of this. His oldest son, Joe, was a war hero. His second oldest son, John, a president. His next oldest son, Bobby, a U.S. Attorney General, a U.S. Senator, and a candidate for president. And Ted, his youngest son, a U.S. Senator. How about the daughters? His daughter Eunice founded the Special Olympics, was married to Sergeant Shriver, who headed the Peace Corps. His daughter Patricia was a journalist who was married to actor Peter Lawford. His daughter Jean was a U.S. Ambassador to Ireland and was married to Stephen Smith. How about grandchildren? Joe's granddaughter, who was Jack's daughter Caroline, served as U.S. Ambassador to Japan. A grandson, Patrick Joseph Kennedy, who is Ted Kennedy's son, served as a U.S. Congressman from Rhode Island. Another grandson, Mark Shriver, son of Eunice, served in the Maryland House of Delegates. Eunice's daughter, Maria Shriver, was a TV journalist and was married to Arnold Schwarzenegger, governor of California. What about great-grandchildren? Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, granddaughter of Bobby, served as Lieutenant Governor of Maryland. Joe's great-grandson and nam namesake, Joseph P. Kennedy III, grandson of Bobby, is currently a U.S. Congressman from Massachusetts and is the only Kennedy currently serving in elected office. Well, there's never been a single family in the history of the United States that has had such a broad record of public service to our country. After Joseph Kennedy's death, Jackie Kennedy stated, he's the reason we exist at all. Without him, without his wisdom, his dream, his desires for his children, none of us would be who we are. We'd all have done something with our lives, obviously, but not this. I'd like to share a personal experience uh, that I had with the Kennedys. I went skiing in Sun Valley uh, and it was after uh, John was killed, John uh, Kennedy was assassinated, and uh, Bobby was there with his family and Jackie with her kids. Uh, I actually stood in line a couple people behind Jackie at lunch one day for a hamburger, uh, and I actually had a conversation with Bobby. The way that happened is I went over to make a reservation at the lodge for dinner. I walked in and there was a sign that said, uh, coats and ties and long dresses required for dinner. And I said, well, my wife and I just have ski clothes. Where can we eat? And they said, well, the Ram pub. So I went down there, made a reservation. As I was walking back, and this is something you kind of never forget, uh, it was snowing lightly. My head was down to keep the snow off my glasses. Someone was coming toward me. One pant leg was tucked in and one wasn't. I don't know why I remembered that. As we got right opposite each other, I looked up. It was Bobby Kennedy. I said, hi. He said, hi. So I've had a conversation with Bobby Kennedy. Well, isn't that what a conversation is to people talking to each other? Well, it turned out we went over to the Ram pub for dinner and in came the Kennedys. They hadn't brought their fancy clothes either. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Nancy, uh, have her tell you a little about herself and have her tell you about Rose's life after 1961. Uh, Nancy? Uh, yes. Um, 
Well, first of all, in real life, my name is Nancy Schuster. Now, I answer a question that we're often asked, and that is, are we married, Russ and I? And the answer is yes. Yes, we are, but not to each other. But we have been acting partners for nearly 30 years when we met in October 1990, playing Mr. and Mrs. Kirby uh, and a, a community theater production of You Can't Take It With You. And as they say, the, the rest is history. Uh, Russ started his production company, and we started out doing murder mystery dinner theaters at Genetti's in Northville, and we were regular performers on the Wild Lake Dinner Train, among other uh, venues throughout the metropolitan Detroit area. Now, I actually... Um, Oh, I actually didn't join his historical pre presentations till about six years ago when he finally added a female role to these presentations. Uh, my acting career actually began in Hollywood, California when I was 12. I worked in several movies, uh, uh, several commercials and a few uh, episodes in various TV shows. And I've continued this work in Detroit, um, the numerous commercials, industrial films, which our uh, training films for businesses, um, and some uh, independent uh, short films as well as a uh, nationwide print ad. Uh, but enough about me, I'll tell you a little bit about Rose after 1961. Uh, I need reading glasses, so excuse me. Uh, Rose suffered a stroke in 1984, 15 years after her husband passed away. She was confined to a wheelchair for another 10 years at, until her death in 1995 at age 104. She outlived four of her nine children. She had 26 grandchildren and 42 great grandchildren. Her son, Ted, said at her funeral, for all of us, dad is the spark. Mother was the light of our lives. He was our greatest fan, and she was our greatest teacher. Rose wrote in her autobiography, I looked on child rearing not only as a work of love and duty, but as a profession at fully as interesting and challenging as any honorable profession in the world and one that demanded the best I could bring to it. What greater aspirations and challenges are there for a mother than to hope of raising a son, a great son or daughter? Well, Rose certainly uh, managed to accomplish that. So uh, thank you for uh, watching. I hope you enjoyed our presentation and perhaps learned something. Uh, so Katie, I'll turn this back over to you and thank you for having us. Thank you so much for being with us tonight and for sharing that wonderful presentation. I thought you both were excellent. It was a lot of fun. We learned a lot. We laughed a lot. And uh, I, I felt very touched by what uh, Rose's son said at her funeral. I almost, I almost teared up a little bit. Um, we really enjoyed having you. It's been a pleasure. And I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight, especially staying through the entire thing to the very end. So thank you so much. And I want to thank all of my uh, Neighborhood Library Association uh, libraries for helping us sponsor this event tonight. So I hope we all see you August 31st, Monday. It's a Monday at uh, same time online for uh, Abraham Lincoln. So thank you all for joining us tonight and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>